In life, we all encounter obstacles, and those obstacles come in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. The question is, how do we handle those obstacles? Do we attack them head on, or do we allow them to make us quit? Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast, where we aim to motivate and inspire listeners to never give up on themselves, their dreams, or their goals. We will interview successful people from all walks of life as they share their no quit stories when they had the choice to give up or give in, but they didn't. We thank you for listening, and we hope to be that jolt of positivity as you go for your greatness. Welcome to episode number 179 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is questioning. Our quote of the day comes to us from Ken Coleman. Good questions inform, great questions transform. Today's episode is sponsored by the good people over at West Fair Communications, who publish the Westchester County Business Journal and the Fairfield County Business Journal. These newspapers do a wonderful job in covering all aspects of the business world within two of the most influential markets in the New York metropolitan area. You can also take advantage of their daily news feeds, which keep track on the companies and thought leaders in these important regions. For more information, take a look at www.westfaironline.com. Trust me, once you start reading, you won't quit. I'm excited to bring you today's episode. Our guest touches upon many different topics that I think we can all relate to. From questions, significance, success, and what's important now, Brian Willis definitely delivers. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Brian, I'd like to welcome you to the No Quit Living podcast. Thanks, Christopher. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate you being here. So the first question we ask everybody is, are you ready to bring it today? Absolutely. Good stuff. So the number one objective of our show is to motivate and inspire listeners to never give up. And I was curious if you have either a personal story of perseverance or perhaps a really challenging time that tested you and you could have given up or given in, but you didn't. Well, um, I guess something that comes to mind is let me start with a quit story and then uh, I'll flow into a no quit. So uh, I grew up in a good home, good family, great parents. But uh, as a teenager, I started to develop some of that victim mentality. Woe is me. And and that mentality led me at 16 years of age to quit school. Um, I was homeless uh, for a number of months living in the backseat of a 1964 Plymouth out on the west coast of Canada. At 18 years of age, I was uh, about 80 or 90 pounds overweight. I was a pack a day smoker. I had a grade 10 education working in a warehouse job that paid me $325 a month. And my dream growing up was to be a law enforcement officer. And so, you know, I'd quit on that for a while, but then I realized that if I wanted to achieve that, I need to change some things. So I started working out. I quit smoking right away, lost a bunch of weight, started volunteering, got super fit, got down to 185 pounds. Um, And then, the city where I was living, I had applied to the police department there. And the first time I'd applied, they said, no, I said, well, what do I need to do to get better? And they said, go away, come back in a year. And that was the only thing they told me. So I went away, did some things I thought would help, came back a year later, reapplied. They said, no, I said, well, why not this time? What do I need to do differently? And their mentality at the time in recruiting was, because I'd never been to college or university, I wasn't smart enough to make it through their training program. Then what bothered me, I guess, with that is that they didn't care what you took if you graduate. As long as you went to college or university, it took at least a year of something that somehow that made you smarter. And I was getting pressure from my boss at the time uh, to make a decision. Am I going to stick with the company and, and keep moving up or am I leaving or what's my plan? And So I almost quit again on the dream of being a law enforcement officer. And then I said, no, I'm not going to quit on this. And so I'd applied to the Calgary Police Service, which is Calgary's three hours south of three hour drive south of Edmonton. And I'd applied to another agency. Calgary was good enough to hire me in 1979. And um, so I started that career path. And when I started with the police department, my my goal is I wanted to be a tactical officer, SWAT guy. And I was unsuccessful my first three attempts to get into the tactical unit. But each time I kept figuring out what do I need to do differently? What do I need to improve? How do I need to make myself better for the next time? And the fourth time I was uh, fortunate enough to get in there. So, you know, there's been a, a bunch of times, I think, like for all of us in our lives where we were pretty close to just quitting and giving up on a dream. And then we stuck with it and pushed through it. And it turned out uh, well for us. So, 
You know, I was I was interested, maybe a little bit scared when you said you were going to share a quit story with us because uh, the whole obviously mo is the no quit. But I think the interesting piece about your story is that it, it's not the times that you didn't get it; it's what happened after it. It's the fourth time in 1979, and then obviously you've you've done that and you've been doing that for a long time. So I wanted to ask you if you just wouldn't mind briefly telling our our listeners a little bit about exactly who you are and what you do today. Well, I, uh, like I said, I was fortunate enough to get hired by the Calgary Police Service in 1979, spent 25 years there, retired in 2004. Now, I spent the last part of my career in the training section as uh, uh, basically, I guess, the head use of force trainer, uh, worked with a bunch of great, highly motivated people, loved showing up to work every day, loved learning, loved training, loved uh, pushing uh, what we were doing to continually find better ways to do things. And so in 2004, I retired from the police service. And for the last 14 plus years, I've been traveling around North America and I've had the privilege of working with uh, a lot of organizations and individuals and trainers on the philosophies. I have a program called uh, Dare to Be Great Strategies for Creating a Culture of Leadership. I have a professional development program for law, uh, for trainers, I guess, in a whole as called Excellence in Training. And so I continue to teach about mindset, about uh, the power of commitment, about accountability, which is, I know you're some something you're uh, very big on and uh, how we can think differently as trainers and leaders. You know, I, I love that. And obviously I was, and I had the opportunity to, to be on your show and we did touch on accountability quite a bit. So I wanted to ask you just to jump into that. What does accountability mean to you? Well, I think accountability is uh, taking ownership, taking ownership for your decisions, taking ownership for your actions. And when you're in a leadership position, taking ownership for your people because your people are going to make mistakes. They're going to screw up. And as an owner, you need to stand up. As an individual, you need to stand up and own up when you screw up. And as a leader, you need to stand up and own it when your people screw up. And it's that philosophy of uh, take the blame and give away the credit. And, uh, you know, I've heard that from a number of people. John Wooden, uh, who I know is somebody that you know uh, or knew when he was alive, and Seth Godin and a number of others talk about that philosophy. But I, I think it's really that ownership, taking ownership for our decisions and our actions rather than playing a blame game and trying to blame somebody else or blame circumstances or blame our boss or blame whoever it is. We just need to take ownership for those things that we say and do every day. No, I, I, obviously that, that hits us near and dear to the No Quit tribe. I wanted to ask you, you said the, the word mindset. I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind just touching on that for a minute. Well, again, I think mindset is, uh, you know, this whole piece of mental preparation is so critical. And we hear about it in athletics. We hear about it in a lot of different forms, the importance of, you know, preparing your mind that, you know, high, the highest performing at the highest levels is 80 percent mental and 20 percent physical. And yet majority of people spend almost all of their time exclusively on the physical aspect and not preparing ourselves mentally. So we need to have that mindset of accountability, that mindset, that growth mindset that Carol Dweck talks about, where we're willing to uh, work through and push through some of the struggles, and we're willing to accept new challenges and embrace new challenges, and we're willing to accept that we can learn and we can grow and we can get better and we can develop. If we're willing to put in the time and the energy, if it's something that's important to us that we feel can make a difference. And so it's that whole mindset. And and I guess that's what I get out of, you know, the no quit living philosophy is that's a mindset is, is I'm not just going to give up because it's hard. If it's important, I will do the work and I will push through it and understand that sometimes we're going to struggle. Sometimes we're going to fail. Sometimes we're going to screw up and that's okay. Those are all opportunities to learn and grow, but we need to work on that mental piece. Imagery is a huge part of that. Self-talk is a huge part of that, but we need to commit the time to work on the mental piece so that we can use the physical skills at our highest levels. You know, I'm really glad that you you touched on the self-talk thing for a minute. I want to just dive into that for a second. I think, unfortunately, when people hear the word self-talk or affirmations, I think a lot of us fall into the trap of these things out there that aren't real. And you look in the mirror and say, I'm great, I'm fantastic. And I think that's not really what what the self-talk and, and the whole mindset component of affirmations. So I just wanted to ask you, what what do you think the importance of having self-talk or uh, affirmations are and, and what 
part did they play or do you see them play in your training and the things you still do today? Well, I think self-talk, that internal dialogue is a, is a part of life. I mean, we have uh, something like 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. Those are our thoughts. Um, and uh, as a friend of mine, Bob Brenner, uh, used to say that the most important conversation that you'll ever have is with yourself, about yourself, and the privacy of your own mind. And when we start to pay attention to those conversations, and some of them are positive and upbeat, but some of them are very negative. And when we start to pay attention to them, what we we realize is what those things that we say to ourselves about ourselves, and we very often say them out loud as well. People need to start paying attention to what people say, you know, when they're using self-deprecating humor, uh, because they will reflect some of those uh, limitations that they have. So the positive self-talk are the things that I have a positive self-image or self-belief in. They're the things that I'm good at, and I believe that I'm good at. But the negative self-talk is what we need to start paying attention to. And then we need to start changing that negative self-talk because we beat ourselves up. And I can tell myself when I make a mistake, you know what, I'm such an idiot, I'm such a screw up. Or we can take the the other mentality and say, you know what, that's not like me. And what did I learn from that? And how can I grow from that? But it's our conversations. We control them. We can change them. Now, the key with controlling self-talk is it's not enough to stop, just stop the self-talk. And the analogy that I heard that I like the best is uh, if you're listening to the radio and there's a song playing that you absolutely hate, if you just turn the radio off, that same song keeps playing in your head. But if you change the channel, now a new song plays in your head. So if you want to to control that self-talk and change some of that negative self-talk, then what we need to do is stop the negative self-talk, but then change the channel and reframe it into something positive. But it needs to be appropriate. It needs to be believable. You know, like you say, if the affirmations are way out there um, and you ask somebody, do you truly, can you imagine yourself actually doing that? And they say, well, no, then those affirmations or positive statements are uh, not going to be effective. But there's a lot of science and research that says that when we can start to audit, monitor, and reframe our negative self-talk, then it can have a tremendous positive impact on performance. No, I I like how you went into that because I think it's the importance of being positive self-talk, but also it's got to be realistic. It's got to be things that you believe in. Now, I want to be clear. It doesn't mean you don't want to strive and have larger goals and things, but the reality is if you're a salesperson and the biggest year you've ever had is fifty or seventy-five thousand dollars. If all of a sudden you say next year I'm going to make five million dollars, I'm not really sure if that's if that's realistic. Now again, I don't want to demean anybody's thoughts or ideas, but the reality is, it, like you said, is they have to be believable, and you have to think and really believe it first on the inside before you can go ahead and and like you said, the biggest part of it is the is the action and taking taking massive amounts of of action. So I wanted to just change lanes for a second, Brian and. If you had to define yourself in one word, what would that word be? I think the word would be questioning. Um, and the reason I use that that questioning, I, I love when you talk to Kevin Eastman and he used the term curious. But for me, I think it's really questioning. It's uh, I'm continually questioning what is it I don't know? What is it that I need to learn? Who is it that I need to talk to? What is it that I need to read? What do I need to study? What do I need to do to apply the science and the research on how humans learn to my training program so that I can enhance the learning uh, opportunity and the learning environment for people that are training, attending my training programs, um, continually questioning why am I doing what am I, why I'm doing? Why do I believe what I believe? Is there other information? Is there perhaps conflicting information? And, uh, and so continually asking those questions, because I think that uh, questions are how we grow. Questions are how we learn. Uh, and we need to continue to hang a question mark, especially on a lot of those things that we've long taken for granted. And we need to keep asking questions. So I'm a huge advocate of the power of questions. And so I guess the one word for me would be questioning. In 2011 and 2012, I was extremely fortunate to have spent some time with, with John C. Maxwell. And he had a book actually that came out a year or so after that program is Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. And it's an unbelievable book, but the simplicity of it is basically just what you said. And I don't want to to knock your word, but I think it's it's so true is good leaders ask 
ask great questions, but it's just in all facets of life. It could be as a good teammate, as a good coach, as a good parent, as a good spouse. It's important to ask those questions because that's how you learn and that's how you grow. Um, so speaking of, of books, I was curious if you haven't read anything recently or perhaps you're reading something now you'd like to recommend to our listeners. Well, I guess uh, a couple have come to mind. Uh, one that I've read in the last month or so. One of them I just uh, is a book I just reread, which is one of my absolute favorite uh, favorite leadership books, and it's called Legacy: Fifteen Lessons in Leadership by James Kerr. And it's a a story about the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, which, if you looked at them as a sports franchise, would be the the most successful sports franchise in the history of sport. But it's about um, the the All Blacks are the gold standard for international rugby, uh, but it's about a rebuilding. In 2004, they hit rock bottom. They had lost focus on the things that made them great, and uh, they w- entered into a rebuilding phase, brought in some new people, some new leadership, new philosophies, and uh, it's about the 10-year journey to, to take the New Zealand All Blacks back to the top of the world in international rugby and then put systems in place to make sure they stay there. So that would be one of them. Another one would be the Dichotomy of Leadership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. I know you're a huge fan of their uh, book, Extreme Ownership, and the Dichotomy of Leadership is their latest book, as as I'm sure you know, where they talk about that some people have misinterpreted some of their messages. So they talk about some of those things from a realistic uh, leadership standpoint, provide some great examples. And then the third one, I guess, would be a book that I know you've read uh, called uh, You Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And, you know, Goggins is, as you know from reading it, and if people haven't read it, I would just search Gog- David Goggins. But it shows the capabilities, I think, of the human body when you get the human mind right. And what I really liked is he doesn't come out with this, you need to go and do these crazy things that I did. But his philosophy is you need to push yourself every day a little bit outside of your comfort zone so that you can grow. So I guess those would be three right off the the top of my head there. I absolutely am a huge fan of Jocko Willink as well as David Goggins. And his book, Can't Hurt Me, Master Your Mind and Defy the Odds. It's actually right in front of me as we speak on, on my desk here. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of his work. But what I love about those, those books you mentioned is they're all about just controlling what you can control. And we often talk about not only on our podcast but also from stage is controlling the controllables. You know, you have to be able to control what you can control. And I think it's really important because David Goggins – wasn't anybody spectacular and if you know his story he was overweight and he wasn't happy but he made a decision and he said at some point and if you listen to any of of his interviews he talks about how he said I realized that nobody was going to do it for me so I had to put myself in the right frame of mind and go after it absolutely and um i really like i i listened to a couple of podcast interviews where people were interviewing him uh before i read the book and it it certainly gave me a little bit of an insight but i it tweaked my curiosity and then i absolutely loved the book and the story and like you say it's uh he's like and he's very clear i'm no different than anybody else it's just about and it goes back to mindset it's amazing when you understand the power of the mind body connection the body is capable of doing absolutely amazing things if the mind is right so no and he's a unbelievable interview i actually Find out, found out about him first from Tom Bailey's The Impact Theory, his video series. And this was a couple of years ago. And then he just had a, a new video where he talks about this book. I think it's about 55 minutes or so, but it's it's excellent. I would definitely recommend it to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. And I would highly recommend Impact Theory uh, just to watch a bunch of those episodes because there's some great thought leaders in that uh, that Tom interviews in that show. Yeah, Tom's done an unbelievable job. And if anybody knows Tom out there, I've been trying for the last – probably 12 to 14 months to get Tom on the show. So if anybody has uh, inside information, please let me know. Yeah, I imagine he's a tough guy to track down. Oh, so. Well, he's a tough guy, but he's he's always doing a, a million things. So I wanted to ask, if, yeah. you, if you would go back, Brian, and give the 20-year-old version of yourself just one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, I would. I guess I would uh, give that 20-year-old version a uh, uh, philosophy that I picked up uh, about 16 or 17 years ago from Blue Holtz, and it's 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 simply a question. It's three words. What's important now? 
And uh, since I, uh, about 16, 17 years ago, I was reading uh, Lou Holtz's book, Winning Every Day, and I was watching a couple of videos of Lou Holtz talking about life lessons and leadership lessons. And in those talks, he talked about that question in the book. He talked about that question. And it's something that I built into every presentation that I've done in the last, since I've read that and watched those videos. And, and I refer to that question as life's most powerful question, that if we ask ourselves this question 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 times a day, what's important now. It helps us to make better decisions. It helps us to prioritize the things that I need to do at this moment. Now, the interesting thing about the question is at face value, some people would think that it's about uh, immediate gratification, but it's it's the ability of the mind to process all that information at hyperspeed and to predict uh, the long-term outcomes and implications of this decision and really use it to make good decisions. And so, so, you know, I would tell myself to uh, to start to embrace that question. What's important now is focus on your health. What's important now is embrace reading. What's important now is believe in yourself. What's important now is uh, pursue your dreams. And I would just pass that message along to that younger version of myself. No, it's a great it's a great term that he's coined, and I know you and I spoke about it on your show, but win. What's important now, I think, is a great thing. It's almost similar to Jeff Woods and the one thing, which is which is what's the most important thing you need to do right now. And I think they're just two great things that just keep you top of mind is what's the most important thing that I need to do right now. And if what you're doing or what you think you're about to do is not the most important thing, then maybe you need to reprioritize. Absolutely. And and the interesting thing with the question, what's important now, because like I said, I've been teaching it for, you know, 16 or 17 years in every presentation I do, regardless of the topic in the audience. And what's amazing is the stories I get back and how people have applied it. I mean, it's being applied in uh, public safety training, all elements of public safety training, but people have used it to, uh, to deal with their battles and uh, win the battle against cancer. People have used it to deal with the death of a loved one. There's coaches, youth sports sports coaches that are teaching it to the kids that they coach, not about winning games, but about making good decisions throughout their life and being contributing members of society. People that use it to make decisions about being a better husband or a better wife or a better father, better mother. Um, it's it's truly powerful The all of the stories that I've heard from people over the years. And I just, I talked about it at a, a presentation a few months ago and got a phone call about a month ago from somebody who was there and said, I just wanted to phone you and tell you the impact this has had on my life. And they left me about a 15 minute uh, voicemail message talking about the impact of that philosophy on their life as they'd started to apply it. So uh, I think the power of it is its simplicity and its diversity in application. And and it's a question that I just absolutely love it. And I, like I say, I refer to it as life's most powerful question. No, I love those stories. And I think it's incredible when you get the opportunity to connect with somebody and you, in essence, pay it forward to them, and you're fortunate to to have it come back to you. And I think receiving those messages, whether they're voicemails or emails or even handwritten notes, I think they just have such a profound positive impact to you and others. So I'm, I'm really glad that, that you were able to experience that. So I wanted to ask you, Brian, what does success or how do you personally define success? Well, I guess when I think of success, I think of, um, you know, I think of a lot of the the push for people to be successful, to make more money, to get their promotions, to get the awards, get the accolades. Personally, I like to to focus on signi- significance and, and not success. I see success as something that I personally gain or personally achieve, and maybe it's, it's promotions or maybe it's awards or maybe it's recognition or whatever. But uh, to me, I think there's a greater focus on significance and significance is uh, what are you doing to others? What are you doing to build up others? I'm a huge quotes guy and I use a lot of quotes in my presentation, but there's a quote out of legacy that says what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Uh, Seth Godin, I, I love a quote that he had where he said, don't tell me what you invented. Tell me who you changed. And another quote from Robert Louis Stevenson is, judge each day not by the harvest that you reap, because to me, that's what's in it for me, but by the seeds that you plant. So that's what are you doing for others? And so personally, I I like to focus, I think there was a time in my life where I was focused on the success, but 
you know, I see a lot of these things and, and the margin, the, the way that people judge success is, do you have a multi-million dollar business? Do you have, um, uh, you know, 500,000 followers on Facebook or Twitter or whatever? And to me, that's, that's not success. I might have a lot of success as a speaker. I might get paid a lot of money. I might pack thousands of people into an, uh, an auditorium, but if, nobody is changed as a result of the interaction, then to me, that's, that's not significance. And so I like to focus on the significance piece rather than the actual success piece, just my interpretation of success. No, I love that. And something that we often talk about on our show is the idea of paying it forward for others. And I think that fits hand in hand with what you said in regards to significance. So I wanted to ask you, what's the best way for our listeners to either follow you or connect with you? Uh, well, I guess I've, there's two websites. There's uh, winningmindtraining.com, winningmindtraining.com, which is my main website that has a list of the classes that I teach. There's a, a training. There's a link to a training blog that I write every Tuesday. Uh, but there's also the other website is life's most powerful question.com, uh, where I write a uh, win Wednesday newsletter every week to talk about uh, some issues, some philosophy that's built around that win philosophy that what's important now philosophy or question no and you know i just want to touch on something you said before in regards to the success answer is i think based on how you're saying is i almost want to come up with the idea or concept if you focus on significance success will follow Absolutely. And, and I guess it's how you define success. And so, uh, but absolutely, if you focus on the significance and you hear that from so many successful business people, if you start a business and start an enterprise and your focus is making money, you're not going to be successful. If your focus is providing value uh, for others and being of service, then the money will, peace will look after itself. So yeah, absolutely. If you focus on the significance of being of service, uh, providing value, value to others of what's in as opposed to what's in it for me what can I do for others um, then the success will follow that and I would certainly agree with that yep so before we let you go Brian I wanted to ask if you have some parting words you'd like to leave with our listeners well, I think people just need to continue to ask themselves that that question, what's important now? And if they think of that numerous times every day, what's important now? And it might be as simple as what's important now is do I hit the snooze button or do I get up and, and go do my workout? What's important now is do I turn on the TV and maybe just watch an hour of mindless television or do I invest an hour in reading? What's important now is do I go for beers again with the people after work or do I go home and spend time with my uh, family? and build those relationships. So I think if we continue to ask that question, what's important now, then we'll continue to make better and better decisions. And another philosophy that I just like to have people think about, and it comes from Jim Collins in his Good to Great uh, work, is he says that regardless of what you have accomplished or achieved, you're always going to be good relative to what you can become. Greatness, it turns out, is not an end state but a journey. And the moment you start to think of yourself as great, your slide towards mediocrity will begin. Because the moment I start to think that I'm a great speaker, a great trainer, a great leader, a great parent, a great whatever, then my slide will start to begin because I will stop doing the work. And we need to show up every day. What's important now is we need to show up every day, do the work, uh, embrace that no quit living philosophy and learn from our mistakes and our errors and keep pushing and keep pushing and keep growing and learning. I love that. I think that's great advice. What's important now? So, Brian, I truly, truly appreciate you spending some time with us. Again, it's an honor to return the favor. It was such a privilege to be on your show. So I appreciate what you shared with us today and definitely hope our listeners check out your websites. And I hope we can talk again soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Christopher. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to episode number 179. Brian really mentioned some key things today that I think we can all truly benefit from. One topic that I thought was very interesting is a question to ask yourself, W-I-N, what's important now? Although this may seem very simple, it's actually not. However, if you continually ask yourself that question and really and truly focus on what's important now, you will yield significant results. Brian's definition of success was awesome. It wasn't money, awards, or accolades. 
Instead, it was focusing on what you do for others. One thing we spent a couple of minutes discussing was the idea of affirmations, or what some people call self-talk. Brian was very clear and specific about the importance of positive self-talk. So my question to you is very simple. What is the self-talk that you tell yourself? Is it always positive? Do you believe it? And most importantly, do you control it? We all have things we continually tell ourselves each and every day. Some of it, I'm sure, is very positive and uplifting, while at times, I'm sure, some is not. But what is it that you do when you have a tough day and your mind goes? What happens when your thoughts wander down a dark hole? So as you go for your greatness in 2019, I challenge everyone to try and control their positive thoughts more often. When you encounter those challenging days, that's okay. Just change your channel, refocus, and do the best that you can. I'd like to leave with a quote by Lisa M. Hayes. Be careful how you're talking to yourself because you are listening. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. We truly appreciate your time, and we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit.